All right, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Um, I'm just going to, I've got everybody on mute, except for a couple of us who are from the program. And so, um, uh, Ryan, Jocelyn, and Sunand, go ahead and unmute yourself. If you can't, I will do it for you. Oh, you're all good. Okay. Anyway, good morning, everyone. Welcome aboard. Uh, thanks very much for your patience. My name is uh, Dr. Ebba Kurtz. I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Health and Science Education in the Cummings School of Medicine, and I'm the Director of the Bachelor of Health Sciences Program. So uh, we apologize for the, for the late start. We are recording this session. I'm making sure that, yep, we are recording this session. So all of you who have registered, even if you join us late, will get a copy of the link to this. Um, and it won't impact uh, your ability to get early registration if you've accepted your offer and paid your deposit. So um, what we're gonna do is I'm going to share my screen. We've got a bit of a presentation for you and we we're going to have lots of times for lots of time for questions. I don't have anywhere to go this morning so I'm happy to stay on the line and answer the questions you have and I'll get to introducing our team members uh, very shortly. So please feel free to use the chat function that's going to be the easiest way but I ask that participants otherwise keep their mics on mute. It just helps with the background. Um, and yeah, welcome on board. And uh, yeah, don't worry if you have uh, uh, dogs, cats, little siblings, moms and dads want to join you in the background, they're all welcome. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you guys are seeing, sorry, I'm working with a double monitor here. Hopefully Let's see if this works. So if I can get a thumbs up that you're hearing the audio, that would be great. Right, so welcome to you at UCalgary. We're really excited to have you join us and to join the UCalgary family. Uh, you're, you're coming to a very dynamic, uh, engaged community, in particular in the Bachelor of Health Sciences program, and we're thrilled to have you. And thrilled to have you on a Saturday morning when I know a lot of teenagers, uh, including my no own, who are uh, upstairs sound asleep. Uh, so welcome to the Bachelor of Health Sciences class of 2024. As I said, I'm Dr. Ebba Kurtz, the Associate Dean and Director of the Bachelor of Health Sciences program. I'm joined today by a couple of uh, great colleagues and students, and I want them to, uh, to just wave or say hello. We've got Ms. Jennifer Logan, BHSC Program Coordinator and Student Advisor. Jennifer, she's there in a pink, pink sweater this morning. Um, we've got three students who are gonna help us out today and give us a bit of the student perspective and help answer your questions. We've got Ryan L, who's a bioinformatics student. There you go, Ryan. We've got Sunand K, a biomedical sciences student, and Jocelyn B. Where are you, Jocelyn? I see you on my screen. <laughs> Health and society. So um, Ryan, Sunand, and Jocelyn have just completed their third year in our program, and so they're entering into their fourth and final year, um, and they are delighted to be here and to share their perspectives. So we've got a really brief presentation today because we want to give a lot of time to your questions and um, we'll make sure that uh, that the chat function is a go. So we are an honors program of study. Each of you has joined us. What does that mean? That means that uh, 
you know, we've got slightly higher standards for you, and, um, but we are there to support you every step of the way. We sometimes get the question, can I choose uh, a non-honor stream? No, that's not what you've signed up for. So we do have our honors program. All of our students do complete an honors thesis in their fourth year. And, uh, and, you know, I'm really proud of how well our students have done. And I've been involved in the program since 2003 when it launched. We have three majors and each of you has applied and been accepted to a major program of study. And those are in bioinformatics, biomedical sciences or health and society. And so we've got our student representatives for each of those majors here with us today. A big portion of our program is inquiry based. And that means that you are in courses that may not look like your typical course. You'll still be taking your regular courses in, in biology or in psychology or in whatever the, the courses are that you need for your major, where you will be sitting in a large classroom and you'll be learning amongst others. But you'll also come together every year in courses where you're learning in an interdisciplinary way and you're learning from one another, where you'll be choosing some of the topics that you work on and doing some team-based projects and the like. Uh, we are a research intensive program. We, we do not uh, tout ourselves as a pre-med program. Some of our students take that path, but we really are a program focused on research and teaching you what it means to be a critical thinker, teaching you the important skills in academic writing, in communication, both to an academic and to a lay audience. Uh, and we have lots of ways that you can get involved in research, whether it's in our courses, whether it's as an independent study student or in our summer research program. And of course, all of this primes you for success for your honors thesis uh, project in your fourth year. So we're a very small program and that has a lot of advantages at the undergraduate level because lots of your friends may be going to programs across the country, around the world, where they are one of, you know, numbers in the thousands of the types of programs that they're going into. Our, across four years, we've got about 370 students. So we usually bring about 100 students into the first year in the program. And, uh, and you'll really get to know your professors, your fellow students very, very well. And of course, you're a part of the community in the coming School of Medicine. Let me just move my cursor over here. I know I intentionally have it not on the, uh, on the full screen show. So what are some of the BHSC advantages? Um, we have generally small class sizes by the measure of what the university standard is. We have a marvelous cadre of dedicated and award-winning teaching faculty who participate in the program um, and really get engaged with our students. And that's not including as well the hundreds of faculty members who mentor and support our students in their research environments. I've already talked a bit about the research intensive program, but two real highlights of that are our summer research studentships that we have, and we have a whole pool of them that are dedicated to Bachelor of Health Sciences students only, as well as our students doing very well in uh, university-wide awards programs as well. We also have quite a unique thing, and that's a research-based independent study course. And you can do one or more of these in typically in the upper years in your program. Um, and these are either one semester or two semester courses where there's an enrollment of one. It's you working one-on-one uh, -on -one with a research mentor, with a faculty member in their research environment to learn by doing. Uh, we have lots of other enrichment opportunities. These include iGEM, which is the Internationally Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, for which U Calgary historically has done really, really well and had a, had a second place finish globally last year. We have a global health program that allows um, students, a select number of students to be involved in research projects and actually travel to international destinations to participate in those. Those have happened in the past in Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, Dominican Republic. Uh, but they vary a bit year from year. And of course, this year, unfortunately, they've been, uh, they've been put on the back burner um, 
for you know, global pandemic circumstances. We also want to support our students. We have mentorship and buddy programs. The mentorship program is where you're matched with a faculty member uh, with whom you can meet and chat a little bit about some of your career goals or, or make connections in research areas of your own interest. And we have a buddy program where you'll get paired with an upper year student to help uh, navigate some of those transitions to university. We have had, I hope we can continue to have our conference travel grants program, which means if you have done research and it is of sufficient depth and quality that you're invited to present at a, at a regional, national or international meeting, we've got a grants program that helps offset some of those co costs. So I'll play you just a, a short video that was made a couple of years ago with the voices of our BHSC students and some of their perspectives in the program. So I thought we would uh, go from listening to those students, and those are now all alumni of our program, because the video was made a couple of years ago. And I'd like to invite the three students that we have uh, joining us this morning to tell us a little bit about their experience or tell us a highlight of something that they do. So why don't we start with Ryan, if you can. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm a fourth year bioinformatics student. Um, I think the biggest uh, change in mindset for me was um, with research. I think before going into the program, um, I didn't have any experience researching. I wasn't one of the science fair kids. Um, so I kind of just went with it um, and just wanted to see what it was like. Um, and then I ended up getting um, an award at the undergraduate research symposium uh, here at the University of Calgary, where you compete against um, the other faculties. Um, so I think that was kind of like when I, I realized that um, if you're kind of open to the different experiences that you're going to get here, um, you never know what's going to happen. Because, um, uh, yeah, that, my project was on virtual reality. Um, so it was definitely something that was very out of my realm. 
Um, going into the program, I also didn't have computer science experience. So a lot of this has just been kind of um, being open to new possibilities. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, how about you, Sanand? Uh, so, so I think my experience uh, in the BHSC program has been great the last couple of years. Um, I think a lot of it, the Dr. Kurz has talked about in terms of it being a smaller program, great instructors, incredible support. Um, personally, I think the biggest um, change uh, was probably the change in my understanding of health or my understanding of what the possibilities might be. You know, you might think that all of us being health oriented, going into a health science program, um, all are heading for the same path. And I don't think that's necessarily true. And I also think that the BHSC program exposes us to a lot of different aspects of health that I hadn't even thought about before. Um, some of the programs uh, Dr. Kurz was talking about before in terms of first year, second year, third year courses, we work um, or, or we, you know, study along with people of other streams. Uh, and so I learned about health and society and bioinformatics, despite being in bio biomedicine. And you really understand the interplay between these different fields. Uh, and I think that the final uh, thing that adds to that is your ability to do research in many different areas, um, whatever really interests you. Uh, you have access to an incredible campus uh, filled with, you know, career researchers that have ex like so much experience in the field. So. It's great to, to have that sort of mindset change. Um, and I think the BHSC program is really important for that. Thanks, Anand. And what about you, Jocelyn? Yeah, so I think I'll um, kind of echo what Ryan and Sinan both said, but um, I think you, looking back from the moment I was at U, at U Calgary um, in April in 2017, I can see a lot of growth and a lot of growth among my peers. And I think it's a lot about just the diverse experiences that we all are exposed to in the BHSC. Um, and one that really sticks out for me is I had the opportunity to travel to Tanzania with the Global Health Program um, last spring um, in May and June. And it was an incredible experience. It was a really, really really huge experiential learning experience and really opened my eyes to kind of what research can look like in a variety of settings and that really changed my perspective kind of on what I assume to be research and what could be research. Um, from that experience I had the chance to present at the Canadian Conference for Global Health in Ottawa and I received support from the BHSC program which was amazing so I've definitely um, really tried to delve into as many experiences as I can as a BHSC student and uh, it's always exceeded my expectations. It's just been a huge learning experience, but there's tons of support and um, a diverse range of opportunities if you're willing to try them out. Great. Thanks very much to you three. We appreciate hearing that as I'm sure our participants today do. Um, so we have all these great things you can do, but everyone knows things don't always uh, go as planned and that we all need a bit of help sometimes. And so I wanted just to highlight some of the student supports we have, if we've got some parents listening in, uh, but also for each of you to understand that, uh, yeah, we all need help sometimes. And um, so we have in Jennifer Logan, a dedicated BHSC academic advisor. And so Jennifer's door is always open and we have a steady stream of students who visit us when we are able to be in person. Uh, but even when we're not, and even in the last six weeks, Jennifer has been there for one-on-one -on -one consultations with students and will continue to do so over the summer. So you'll see Jennifer's name pop up on emails uh, and she gets, in fact, we all do. We all get to know our students on a first name basis and that's a big advantage that you have in a small program. Great thing about having a dedicated academic and, and student advisor is that we can help connect you with resources across campus if that's what's warranted. Uh, we do have a, a full service student wellness center on campus. We have a student success center, which has lots of great workshops. Uh, if you need help with some aspect of your studying or time management or things like that, they have some uh, wonderful programming there. They also have a writing support center where you can go and get some feedback on, on uh, drafts of work that you're doing. Uh, we have student accessibility services. If, if you need an accommodation um, in order to ensure that you have a level playing field for your academic success, 
the Student Accessibility Services is there to support you. They also help support our students if you have something that's transient. We've had students who have, you know, because they've had an accident and they've broken their arm that they need some additional supports and, and accommodations. Those can be done just as much as, as someone who may need uh, longstanding accommodations. We like to engage our students in what we do and lots of ways to get involved there. Um, through the office, we have the BHSC Engagement Committee, which focuses a lot on trying to build community and having events for our students. So we bring in alumni and have career nights uh, where you hear about the different pathways people have taken out of our program, where they go out and, and engage with our community uh, broadly in Calgary in, in events and supporting those uh, in need. We have the Health Sciences Students Association, which is a club through our student union or our, our student government. Um, they have a lot of great student supports as well as um, events that they put on, usually an annual uh, formal event and other things that they do to welcome students and build community in the program. And we have our student faculty liaison committee, SFLC, that works with Jennifer Logan and serves as a good bridge between uh, the students and the team in the office where there are concerns that need to be addressed. They also do some programming and outreach uh, among students. And I know, I know at least Ryan can probably speak to all three of those. I think he's been involved in all three committees if you have questions about that. We don't need to select Mr. Dino there. Uh, so what we wanna do, because most importantly, we wanna hear from you and we wanna hear what your questions are. We've put together a couple of frequently asked questions because some of you have been reaching out to Jennifer already to ask this, or we know uh, time and again that these are questions that students commonly have. So we'll address a few of these and then throw it open to you. So a question that we get a lot is, should I take my AP or IB course credit instead of my first year courses? So I'm gonna ask Jennifer if she wants to feel that one, please. That's a really good question, particularly this time of, you know, it, the current situation we're in. Most students choose to retake the courses, even though they may have AP or IB credit for a variety of reasons. First reason is the transition from high school to university is, is quite a transition. And if you've got some coursework that you've got a degree of familiarity with the subject matter, it can be a great aid in that transition to university and quite frankly it can also be a GPA booster. Additionally there may be some destinations, some professional schools or programs you want to apply to after your degree program that may have prerequisite requirements that specifically stipulate that those courses that are prerequisites to applying must be done in a university setting not a high school setting. And I think the last reason to consider and this may be particularly relevant this year, is that your courses were taught in a high school setting and not taught in the university setting. And they may or may not be conveying all the prerequisite knowledge that you need to be successful in the more senior level courses that they are prereqs for. If you're not planning to go to a professional school that has those specific requirements, and keep in mind, we you, you need to sort of do a little bit of a survey of the landscape of prerequisite requirements for what you might want to do afterwards so that you're aware of these things because that's a constantly changing landscape. But, um, you know, if you want to take the credit for uh, an English half course equivalent that uh, two majors have as the requirement, that's fine. What I would recommend to you, though, is when you register for your courses next week, that you re register for the courses according to the program outline that I sent you all um, yesterday afternoon. And the reason that is, you just want to, you want to secure seats in classes. Believe it or not, it's competitive getting a seat even in required classes. So when you register, register for the full five courses required for fall term and five courses for winter term, six if you're a BIMF bioinformatics student and then what that does is that gives you the luxury of time knowing that you've got a seat in all these classes and gives you the luxury of time making a decision whether or not you want to switch something up take a slightly reduced course load so I strongly recommend that all students register according to their program outlines initially and then we can confer and make decisions going forward. 
Yeah, if you do register for a class, you know, next week or the following week, you have until one week into the start of classes to to drop that class without having any financial penalty. So you get all your tuition refunded on that course. So if, you, if you're unsure if you're gonna take one of these credits, register for the course anyway, hold that seat. You've got plenty of time to make the decision that, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna take that class, okay? Um, all right, so that addresses that. We encourage you to think about, about what it means and, and whether or not it might be best for you to retake some of those classes. Uh, a difference might be if you're holding uh, IP or IB or AP credit in a course that is unrelated to our program. So perhaps you took IB French or you took an IB, um, I don't know, <laughs> IB Spanish course and you want to apply that as a credit towards one of your open electives, that would be just fine. Those are not courses that you would otherwise be taking in our program, but we would encourage you to think very carefully if it had to do with biology, chemistry, uh, physics, math, or English. Oh, Jennifer, yeah. Just yeah and I was, I was just going to say, take all the necessary steps to have all the AP and IB course credit um, sent to the university so that it's there. Uh, whether you use it or not, it's nice to have it on your record. All right. Um, often we hear from students, they want to know, how can I get involved in research? And we have no expectation that, that students come in having any exposure to research at all. It's incredibly rare. So the vast majority of your, of your fellow classmates have never been involved in research, and we recognize that. And so we have a couple of things that we do to help you with that. In the fall, uh, Jennifer hosts a Getting Ready for Research workshop. She usually runs this on a, on a Saturday so that we make sure we're not interfering with, <clears throat> pardon me, with your uh, scheduled classes. And she shares some tips about preparing your CV, that's your curriculum vitae, which is basically an academic resume. And what kinds of things you might be able to put on, to, on it when you have very few things to report. Um, she also shares tips for how to connect with a faculty member in an area that you might be interested in, how to even find that information about faculty members, and she shares a little bit about the funding opportunities that are available. Those don't open up until uh, December, January, Usually the deadline to apply for summer studentships happens in early February. So uh, not something that you have to really be worrying about right now, uh, and we will be supporting you when you join us in the fall. You can also, as I've talked about our independent study courses, that's a great way to get involved in and get a better understanding for research. Uh, and then of course, you can always apply for a summer research position. These are, um, this is an optional thing. Students do, are not required to participate in summer research. Uh, some are unable to for a variety of reasons. Some choose not to, but uh, we have opportunities galore if that's something you do want to do. Jennifer, anything to add on, on getting involved in research? Um, yeah, hope, hopefully we are having our research symposium in the fall and that you all attend. It's an absolutely fabulous way to see what your fellow BHSC students have been doing. That's right. So this is an evening we have uh, typically in October where BHSC students who have been doing research in the preceding summer or the preceding year uh, share their research. Some are selected to do an oral presentation, so we have a bit of an oral presentation part, and then lots of people present their research through posters, and we uh, provided it's allowable. We'll have us all together and, and, and pizza to on, on tap as well. So um, watch for that, and we encourage you to attend. Uh, we often get this question from students who, uh, who are less familiar is where are classes held? The University of Calgary, if you don't already know, it, has, uh, has multiple campuses. So those of you from Calgary and surrounding area will certainly be familiar with our main campus, uh, where we have the cluster of our buildings. This, is, this sits uh, just west of Crowchild Trail between 24th Ave and 32nd Ave. Um, but we also have our Health Sciences Campus, which is adjacent to Foothills Medical Center. 
So, uh, and, and there's additional campuses, but uh, at Spy Hill for the vet school, but we don't uh, participate there, nor are we out at the downtown campus. So in the early years of your program, many of your classes will be held on the, what we call the main campus. That's the large University of Calgary campus. And that's a lot of your foundation courses in, uh, depending on your major, but it might be in biology, chemistry, English, math, uh, physics, psychology, computer science. Those are all held on, on main campus. But in every year of the program, and more and more so as you reach the upper years of the program, you also take classes at the Health Sciences Center, which is where our office is located. Um, and so that means that students actually move between campuses. And I'll certainly in, invite the three students we have with us today to comment on this. Uh, what you do have access to a bus pass as part of your student fees, so you can climb on and off any uh, Calgary Transit bus, and there are buses that connect the two campuses as part of their regular route. Uh, and lots of students walk, and it's, uh, you can walk it depending on if you're walking slowly or, or doing it with a bit of uh, speed, you can certainly move between campuses. But it is something you will have to keep in mind as you think about uh, making a course schedule. So maybe I'll throw it open and I'll just let you, any or all of you jump in with any advice you have in planning the schedule and time for commuting. Um, I can go ahead. I would just recommend making sure that you're giving yourself enough time between your scheduled classes to move between campuses. And I think the schedule builder will kind of give you a warning if they're within 15 minutes of each other and they're on different campuses. But um, I would definitely just kind of be careful with that. And even, I'm not really sure because I think it depends on the program and how your options kind of fall into place. But um, even like a 30 minute break would be sufficient to get over and have enough time to get settled and find your class. And uh, if you're, you've got some like big assessments or whatever um, between campuses, you should probably try to check the um, bus schedules on like multiple apps. I had a situation where um, I had to run from Foothills to main campus for a B-Chem lab because the bus um, didn't come. So sometimes you kind of just got to uh, plan it out uh, ahead and try to not go to the last bus possible. I, for students when they're transitioning, and I teach in the second year of the program, um, and we have a big class that, that runs from noon to three on two days a week. And so, you know, I'm aware that lots of students come in from labs and, and a lot of our instructors, at least at the Health Sciences Center, are very aware that, that students sometimes have to tiptoe in a couple of minutes late, and that's usually not a problem at all. But bear that in mind, where possible, try to give yourself enough space between classes uh, and otherwise, you know, pack your runners. <laughs> uh, but you will have classes on both campuses, and so you'll have to pay attention to that. Uh, what will the fall 2020 semester look like? We're getting a lot of this um, question, and I wish I had a crystal ball. It is, uh, there is a lot of scenario planning going on at the university right now. This is the case with universities from coast to coast in Canada. I've been involved in conversations with other universities and to the best of my knowledge, not a single one has made a plan for fall 2020. Um, you know, we were able to pivot quite quickly when COVID emerged as a real concern for us in mid-March and were able to see through the, um, through the rest of the academic year. And I think actually it went reasonably well for at least the classes that I'm aware of and involved in. Uh, I think most universities, I'm not promising this, most universities will likely have a plan of attack by mid-May to end of May, that they'll know what the situation looks like. Lots of factors that they have to consider. It's not just, um, you know, what would it look like if we brought students all into the classroom at the same time, but it could also be what does residence look like and residence life look like if, uh, if physical distancing measures are still in place. I think it's very hopeful that as I read the newspaper every day and I see what's happening across the country, that we have done a phenomenal job in Canada of really crushing the curve and with some 
very careful and staged um, increases in activity, we may actually do well to be living with COVID for years ahead. Um, as a health sciences program and certainly knowing, understanding the intersection between the value of bioinformatics and being able to do modeling and doing this with epidemiology and public health from our health and society sector. And I think this pandemic hits at home uh, better than anything else we could use for advertisement. And really the biomedical side of understanding what this virus is and how can we better develop um, uh, therapies or vaccines for it. You know, I think we take this in stride. And so the University of Calgary, as all universities across the country, will be committed to absolutely top quality uh, educational experiences. But at this point, uh, my crystal ball at least appears to be broken. So um, stay tuned. And as soon as we have information, we will share it with you. When should I register for my classes? Jennifer, take it away. Uh, next week. <laughs> Registration opens next week, uh, begins on the 7th. My understanding is that because you pre-registered for this event and you have attended or attending this event, that your registration day and time will get bumped up a little earlier. And that's actually a good thing because to get a version of a schedule that you're very happy with, you need to prep ahead of time and register early. And please, please, please remember to register for both fall and winter. You have the opportunity to edit, change, swap classes, all these kinds of things right up to the first week of term. But it's really important that you register right away so that you've got a schedule to work with. Um, when your registration, like in the email I sent you yesterday, I hope you read it from the whole email. Um, I know sometimes students have a hard time getting past the first few sentences of my emails on occasion because they can be lengthy. But I've put a lot of really valuable registration information in there. You need to go to the link, read about the registration process. What does it mean to initialize my registration? Learn about it so that when your day and time comes, you're prepped and ready to go. Take advantage of Schedule Builder. Look at many, many versions of schedules and remember that your first choice of a schedule may not work out when you go to register because some of those classes will fill and you may have to look to other sections. Um, and there is a new student registration assistance team that you can contact. And obviously you can also contact me. I've got one of my colleagues prepped and ready to help with registration issues. And we can be your liaison with other departments. It's probably better to not, as a matter of fact, I will tell you, please do not contact the Department of Biological Sciences or Chemistry or Economics if you cannot get into those courses. The capacity to deal with student concerns is a little bit different this year. So other faculties want to have the capacity to deal with their own students, but we can help be that middleman if you're having course access issues, okay? So you've all got my email address. Um, we can meet one-on-one -on -one by Skype, Zoom. Um, I can even phone you if you need to. We will walk you through the process, but I'm pretty confident that most of you will be able to navigate the process quite independently. But the key is prepping ahead of time, having multiple versions of the schedule ready, and um, use the job aids that are available. And um, I'm assuming we've got some bioinformatics students present. You are the first cohort that have the privilege of registering for six courses in the winter term instead of just five. But I want to re reassure you, uh, MedSci, Medical Science 201 is a brand new course. We have piloted it. It was a great course, a great experience for our students. It's a block week course. So that means you're registering for that course for the one week prior to the start of lectures in the winter term. And the course is all contained within that block week and it will not affect your workload into the term. Um, if you're having any problems with being on campus, assuming that we are all operating in person for that, do let me know because we'll have to coordinate with the bioinformatics director. So don't be frightened by the thought of six courses in a term. It's doable, right, Ryan? <laughs> I mean, I didn't do that, so I don't know. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it's talking about the work, the workload. Um, 
I, not that I want any first year student doing it, but you do have the ability to register for six courses should in more senior years you choose to. So the keys for registration, just to summarize, are take the time to prep ahead of time, learn what you're doing, have multiple versions of a schedule that you can live with and register when your day and time uh, comes. Now, I actually do not know when the university will check your enrollment time. Um, that's something you can check and look at. It says enrollment, what is it? Enrollment appointment, is that what the terminology is on your student center? Um, that means that's the day and time when your access opens. So they will be updating that for those of you who are here today with us, but I'm not sure when, when they will do that, likely Sunday night or Monday morning. And remember, register for both fall and winter classes. That means your September classes and your January classes all at the same time, please. Because we've had uh, challenges in the past when students say, okay, I'm good for September and then have challenges in the winter. So uh, do that, please. Um, Okay, now it's your turn. So what questions do you have for us? I'm gonna ask that I think it's most efficient if you can use the chat function in Zoom and write your questions there. We, um, we may pool them together if we see questions of a common theme. So we know you guys have questions. And they could be for me, for Jennifer, for the students, um, whatever's on your mind. Can I just say to everybody how excited I am for um, fall and get a chance to meet you all and work with you. Um, and you will get information about orientation in the fall. So whatever orientation will look like, I am excited to see you all there. That was, that was my final FAQ, but we'll, oh. deal, with, we'll, we'll deal with this. Uh, but yes, you should be participating in fall orientation, please. It, whether whether we're in person or whether we jig something up online, please participate. We encourage you. It's uh, it's of value. Um, I, I see a couple of questions I can um, direct right there. So I said um, I said May seventh. I I misspoke there. We've we've had changes in dates um, because of what we've been dealing with with COVID nineteen. Dates, deadlines, and everything seem to change on a daily basis. So if your enrollment date says May 6th, then you're prepped and ready to go for May 6th. R Ryan, there's a question there about what is the difference between Comp Sci 217 and 231 and what bioinformatics probably should take? I, I think that's a good question for you to address. Yeah, especially uh, me. Um, so basically, I'd say that 217 would be the more preferable one to take. Um, 230, there's really no difference in content. Um, I, you, the friends that I had that took 217 basically were learning the exact same um, types of code. So it's not like you're gonna be behind when you go to those senior courses. Um, the real difference, I think, is mentality. Um, 217 is interdisciplinary, so they understand and they acknowledge that there's gonna be a mix of different um, learners versus 231 where they're expecting you to be going into industry with uh, like Apple or Microsoft. So they're trying to really grill you and make sure that you know it and it's just a little um, less lenient, I'd say. So I'd say for a bioinformatics student, 217 would probably be your best bet. There you go. So we've got a question about minors. Jennifer, do you wanna tackle that one? Yeah, um, so a minor is something where you there is another discipline and you want an exposure to it. A minor consists of 10 courses. Yes, Bachelor of Health Sciences students are eligible to add a minor to their program, but not in the first year. Uh, a minor is a great, a great thing that we can have a chat about when school starts. Um, you can send me an email if you're interested in, in a minor, but what we would do is where you don't have the ability to officially have it added until you've completed a certain number of units. So generally what I would do is officially add the minor as a sub plan to your program just before you register for the next fall winter. So that would be like next winter term, but we can talk about it in the fall. What I suggest to students, if you have an idea of a minor you're interested in, is that sometime you might want to take a course in that discipline just to try it out. It, it's, it's a great idea. I mean, we can always remove a minor after you've done it, but uh, 
How do you find out what the requirements for any particular minor are? You can go to the University of Cal um, Calgary calendar. Um, if you don't know where to find that, I suggest you all go to the U of C main page and find the link to the calendar. That's like your handbook for your time in the program. You can find out just about anything you need to know by looking up in the, minor, in the calendar, including requirements for a minor. And yes, students in our program have had all kinds of minor, business minors, um, computer science minors, psychology minors, just uh, any minor available, I think has been undertaken by one of our students, including the hardest to get into minor of the program, architectural studies, so. Yeah, we have a fairly recent graduate, he's a couple of years out, who uh, was a biomedical sciences student, but was really fascinated by design and structure. And so he did an architectural studies minor and is now doing a master's in architecture at Yale with an interest in designing healthcare environments. So he's taking his understanding of what he's learned in health sciences, what he understands about disease transmission and, and you know, social facets of health, and he is actually uh, applying that in learning the principles of architecture and design. So our students do all sorts of uh, marvelous things. Um, someone has asked a question, how are MDSC structured? I presume that's courses that start with MDSC. So what that refers to MDSC is just the four uh, letter code for medical science. So we have both MDSC courses and we have HSOC course, H-S-O-C, those are those are some select specific courses for health and society. The medical science courses are really uh, designed in a diverse number of ways. We have some that are very much a lecture style. We have others that are inquiry based. We have um, the independent study courses have MDSC, so that could be one on one. So really, it's it runs the gamut. Uh, and there isn't just a specific way. So lots of them are not research focused, but um, Many of them, if they're inquiry-based, they just take a very different approach to learning in the classroom. Um, you know, and the students will know, having attended my, uh, participated when I teach, uh, you know, we use the whiteboard a lot, as opposed to coming in and having 90 PowerPoint slides that you're gonna crank through, it's actually a lot of discussion-based, or, or for five minutes, break out into a small group, talk about an idea, let's bring them to that back and, and share ideas. So lots of different structures that we use in those courses, lots of different assessments. Sometimes it is a test, sometimes it's writing papers, uh, sometimes it's doing a, a project, a poster presentation, um, you know, we've had students in a, do skits and videos and all sorts of things. So uh, they really differ a lot. Um, when Jennifer mentioned that, there's, that the university calendar is really important, that's not a calendar in the way that you see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's not that kind of calendar. It's really the, the collection of all the course descriptions. It's the collection of all the academic regulations. There is, and this is addressing a question, there is a section on the calendar page where you can go to current fees and, and schedule, and that will allow you, someone's asking about a breakdown of fees, that will show you how much it costs for each three unit course, that's a half course, a one term course, how much it costs for each of those, and it will itemize what the fees are. Um, there's a students, there's a, a student services fee that includes athletics access and, and your UPASS and, uh, and your health insurance and all of those kinds of things. So that's a great place to look, but your fees, the Bachelor of Health Sciences program fees are no different from any other uh, you know, BA, BSC program on campus. We are not a differentially priced program. Um, I, I will address the MDSC 201 block week. So winter term actually starts on Monday, January 4th. Most lectures don't start till Monday, January 11th. So that one week, those five days is called block week. So for MDSC 520, uh, 201, it, a block week course is an intensive condensed ex uh, course experience that runs for five days. You're in class from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. over those five days. MDSC 201 takes place on, in a special um, learning lab in the Taylor Institute on main campus. But what I will do for bioinformatics is I'll get your um, director, Dr. Anderson, who also instructs that course, to put together an information email so you, and, and we'll get that sent out to all of you so you understand a little more about what this 
MDSC 201 experience will be like. When you're checking courses, and I know somebody mentioned they go into Schedule Builder and it says some courses are full. If you actually want to see what is happening, which lectures and sections are open, you should actually do the search for classes function through your student center and not Schedule Builder. Um, so in some science courses, it's the lab component that is the registration component. So you find a seat in the lab and then, then you are placed in the corresponding lecture. I noticed that in Chemistry 201, there is one lab section that is full. So that's probably what's generating that um, message. And speaking of chemistry, somebody mentioned about the ability to take Chemistry 211 instead of 201, the chemistry course um, that's designated for chem majors. Uh, my understanding is that the chem department is not offering that course this year. So it's, it's not an issue this year, but sometimes the chemistry department or another department would let you into special sections, but that's decided on a case by case basis. So um, all biomedical sciences students and bioinformatics students will be registering for chemistry 201 and 203, and you can take those courses in either order. All right. Uh, Sunam, there's a question for you. Since you're a biomed student in uh, just finished the third year, what are you planning to take? Where are you planning to take your skills after you graduate? Yes. Um, uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, we're just starting our fourth year here, so nothing is solidified. But um, uh, as many of the other students in our program, you know, I hope to um, apply to professional school, specifically medical school, and perhaps also graduate school. Um, uh, so furthering some of the research interests that I've developed in my undergrad program. So sorry, I, you know, I, I also don't have uh, <laughs> the, the crystal ball as to where I'll be going next year. But, um, uh, you know, one thing I really recommend um, is uh, there is a program. Um, I'm not exactly sure the name. I'm sure um, either Dr. Kurz or Ms. Logan can clarify. It's a event that's happening every single year where you can look at some of the students that graduate from the program, uh, they come back to the school and give you ideas on where you can take uh, your career after our program. I thought it was incredible because it shows you all of the non-traditional and traditional paths that can come out of any of the three majors. Um, and maybe I'll let um, either of them elaborate on that. So we usually have two events every year, in the, one in the fall and one in the, one in the winter term. Um, and they usually have different themes. So we bring uh, program alumni back who have really taken interesting paths. We also try to highlight some of those alumni and some of those paths through our social media accounts. Um, because, yeah, because we've had students do all sorts of things. We have lots who've gone on to become entrepreneurs. We've had two Rhodes Scholars. We've had a Knight Hennessy Scholar. We've got about a third of our graduates go on to medical school, but that means two thirds are choosing to do something else. So another 30% uh, go on to, um, to graduate school. Someone was asking about masters in engineering. Absolutely, we've got students who've gone into engineering programs after uh, leaving us. We've got um, uh, one of our graduates is doing his PhD in biomedical engineering at Harvard right now. Um, his brother, who also went through the program, is doing it in computer engineering at U of T. I mean, so really, the sky's the limit. We've had people found NGOs. We've had, um, you know, they've gone on to study at, at top universities across, um, across Europe, in the UK, Australia, uh, across the US, and, and coast to coast in Canada. So really, it's, it's taking advantage of the fact that the program has some latitudes for you where you can really explore what you are interested in or keep your mind open that you may come in thinking, ah, I'm for sure going to have step three or four steps forward straight into this path. Um, but if you take the time to actually smell the roses on the side of the path, you never know what you're going to discover that you had no idea was a possibility coming out of our program. And I think that's, that's the really exciting thing. And it goes across all streams, right? And, um, and so we're there to help you explore that. And by bringing back our alumni in these sessions, which we anticipate we will continue, we have no reason not to continue them, um, that gives you a chance to, to peek into some of those. I'll just, I'll just put a plug in for our social media accounts. If you're an Instagram user, if you go to UCalgaryBHSC follow, um, we do a pretty good job of profiling alum on our um, Instagram site too. You can 
see what they're up to. Um, uh, yeah, and we've got Facebook and we're on Twitter if, uh, if you're on any of those platforms. Uh, there was a question posted about volunteer opportunities. Lots of our students take advantage of uh, and give back to the community in many different ways. The program does not per se uh, connect you to specific volunteer opportunities, but there is an office on campus that, that helps to advertise certain things. And lots of students will go out and on their own initiative find, find the thing that resonates with them or perhaps continue something that they've been doing already. Uh, so absolutely, and there's, there are opportunities that are within uh, the hospital setting. Um, and the Foothills Medical Center has a volunteers office as well that can connect you to what's available there. But we don't per se make those arrangements through our program office. We encourage them, absolutely. Um, Brian has asked a question about how the change in funding will it affect the number of research opportunities for BHSC students. So depends on which change in funding you're meaning, Brian. So we've of course got, um, got reduced transfers from the uh, Alberta government to universities across the province. Uh, I don't anticipate that that will uh, have any sizable impact. We don't, those monies are not used to fund our summer studentship program. And so the funds that we do have for the summer studentship program are not at risk um, at all at this point. So I really don't think that's going to affect it. Now, federally, uh, research funding uh, bodies, that's, that's by the federal government does a lot of science research funding. That may or may not, if an individual faculty member uh, doesn't get their funding, that may impact their ability to offer a position in their lab. But we have over 700 faculty members in the coming School of Medicine, far exceeding the number of students we have. We also have students who work in kinesiology and chemistry and biosci and, and uh, across campus. So as far as positions that might be available, I also don't expect any problem. You know, even though we're not face to face at the moment this summer on campus, um, we still held our summer studentship program and every single funding partner who contributes to this big uh, website where we have all the award opportunities, uh, every single one of them committed to continuing this summer and students are doing a lot of projects where they're just doing it on a remote basis. And if we get to come back to be face to face later this summer, they'll uh, continue their projects in a face to face manner. So I'm confident that all of that will continue. Um, let's see. Uh, Raman was asking, we, we are recording the session. We will be sending you a link. So if you need to re listen uh, or review, not to worry. Jennifer, there's a question about physics. Yeah, so I, I alluded to this. I covered this a little bit in the email you received yesterday. There is a bit of a difference between 211 and 221. Uh, content is the same, but the amount of time to cover the content is greater in physics 211 than 221. Um, you don't actually have a choice about which you register in. Um, you have to register according to your prerequisites. The Faculty of Science will take out the students that have the prereqs for Physics 221 if they choose to register in Physics 211. I know a lot of you have already expressed concern about the way this semester has gone. Uh, because of COVID-19 and not feeling adequately prepared for what you have to take in the first year. But keep in mind, every student in um, Physics 221 and Math 265 is in the same situation. And the Faculty of Science is aware of the situation and they will deliver the course in a way that will meet the learning needs of the students in it. So if you will have completed Math 31, and Physics 30, you have to register in Physics 221. If you've only completed one of those course, like you have Math 31, but not Physics 30, then you register in 211. You have to have both Physics 30 and Math 31. For first year calculus for biomeds and bioinformatics students, if you've got Math 31, you have to register for Math 265 and not Math 249. So register according to your prereqs. Um, Any is asking a question about, it, you know, if restrictions, if we do open, uh, you know, might there be restrictions in place? 
I don't have my crystal ball and those are decisions that are being made at a, at a much higher pay grade than, than me and will be also directed by our provincial government and by the um, uh, provincial um, uh, chief medical officer of health. So we don't know yet and hopefully within the coming weeks we'll have a bit of a better sense for what that looks like. Um, and I think that, is, that applies across the country. So um, there's a question here, maybe Jocelyn uh, can help. I think mo both Jocelyn and Jennifer maybe. So for health and society, how should I proceed if the major courses I'm considering conflict with the other required courses for first year? Will this impact being able to uh, declare it as my concentration? Do you want me to talk about that, Jocelyn? Sure. <laughs> okay, so um, the purpose of the major options in your first year could be to get the prereqs for a concentration you know you already want. But really, the purpose of the major options is for you to explore the various areas. Um, occasionally, other faculties, the Faculty of Arts, schedule courses so that you can't complete Health and Society 201 and take, for instance, Psychology 200. Um, your first priority in your first year is to register for the courses that are required in your program. So Medical Science 203 is a required course that you need to take in fall term. Health and Society 201 is a required course. Choose from the major options that work with the schedule. And there's a lot of different strategies and ways we can make sure you get those courses. You can still declare a concentration even if you, like for instance, you could declare a concentration in psychology, even if you haven't completed both Psych 200 and 201 in your first year. So it doesn't affect your ability to declare it as the concentration. We just may have to help you figure out when you're going to take those courses other than in your first year of university. Does that help? Um, Inara, please feel free to email me. We can, we can chat offline about this further. We've got a couple of questions up there about scholarships. So we will, uh, the BHSC program will be uh, sending out offers for, uh, we've got entrance, two different, two different levels of entrance scholarships. So those have not yet gone out uh, and will be going out based on the admission GPAs and, uh, and supplementary application scores. So, um, so stay tuned because those will be coming out. Um, there is a, I believe, and it's not because it's, it's not run out of our program, but out of the enrollment services and the recruiting office. I think everybody who's participating today across campus in all the different programs that there is a draw for uh, some additional scholarship dollars. I believe that that's a lottery system for those who have pre-registered for the event. And, uh, and there isn't a, a one that's specific for, for the BHSC program. So we've got a question also, Eva, about uh, study abroad. Um, any student that's interested in doing a study abroad program, I invite them to come meet with me. So the question has to do with taking a semester abroad at a university that's not a partner of U of C. That gets a little more complicated and the student navigates much of that process on their own. Students who choose to do a semester abroad at a university that's a partner institution. They get a lot of help and support navigating the process from the international office. So any student that finds, wants to explore this, um, we can meet and talk about it. We can talk about the long-term impact on time to completion of program, how courses transfer back, all these kinds of things. So happy to meet privately with any students who want to sort of um, internationalize their degree by doing some study abroad. There's lots of options available to you and we can chat about it. Yeah, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to happen in the September to April timeframe. We've had students who have gone abroad and taken coursework that falls in the May to, um, <coughs> pardon me, the May to August period. And they've been able to transfer back course credit because of the nature of the courses they've taken. So I know a few, a, a couple of years ago who took a course I believe it was based out of Singapore, and then it actually involved, it was, a, it was a public health course, it involved actually field tripping, field trips into southern India, where they were doing data collection that came back and then did analysis, and so it was able to transfer over as one of our health research uh, courses. 
Um, but yeah, sometimes it can add time to your program, but we're absolutely happy to work with you and work with the study abroad office at the University of Calgary here to help make it work. And we've had lots of students do that in the past. Uh, Anita asking a question. I, I presume the awards draws for today are based on pre-registrations um, because members of the enrollment services are not in on our webinar, so they wouldn't know the timing of when you were able to log in and join us. But as I said, that one is being run out of another office. We, and we, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a chat with um, the people on main campus running the event overall, and I've got assurances from them that if you joined late, it won't negatively impact your early registration or your eligibility to be in the competition for the scholarship. So it's all good. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been here at the University of Calgary now for, um, well, I've been here for a quite, quite a while, but especially in my leadership role in the last seven years, I can say that we take first and foremost a student-centric approach. Anytime we wanna make a change, the first thing we think about is, is this, is this in the student seat? best interest? Is this fair? Will this negatively impact students? And that is certainly the first lens that we consider. Um, I see Drayden's asking about reduced course load, taking courses spring and summer. Uh, yes, you can do a slightly reduced, reduced course load fall and winter and, and make up those courses in spring or summer term. Um, perhaps we can talk offline about that because it varies from major to major how you should do this. So bioinformatics is probably the more complicated, takes the most consultation, but um, we can, we can, any student who is, wants to explore a reduced course load, first of all, I, I recommend you register for all the courses for fall and winter, and then we can set up a time to chat, and then we can talk about which courses you might want to remove from your schedule. But I think it's a good idea to get the full schedule, and then we make decisions later instead of deciding now, because if you change your mind, it's easier to remove a course from your schedule prior to start of term than to add a course. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, as Jennifer pointed out, you've got to be careful which courses you don't do in that first term because <clears throat> only select courses are available in spring and summer semesters. Uh, and just because something has been offered in the past does not mean it necessarily is offered in future years. So something to keep in mind. Um, uh, I The questions about the draw awards, you would have to be directed towards uh, the Enrollment Services Office, the team who set these things up. Um, I am not familiar with whether or not they, wh what's happening about extensions and eligibility and so forth. Yeah, those are just things not done at our house, at, uh, in our uh, program office. Eva, there's a question there that you might want to address. Are the entrance awards for final average grades affected by the current situation? And uh, no, so we, um, I mean, when we consider students for admission, we got, get sent uh, a series of, well, we get sent your admission average. We also have your supplementary application score, which is derived within our program. And so we use those two pieces to look at our scholarships. We do not go and draw um, newer grades from, from the system. Some of them aren't even available. What the university doesn't do polls from, um, from Alberta education, and we don't have your, your current term grades yet available. And so, um, yeah, so we do it. And I don't anticipate then that there would be any change that was due to COVID. Yeah. There's a question there about uh, graduate school. Is it possible for me to change my course to engineering in my master's, although I have applied for health science program? Um, this is probably an instance where if a student knows they're heading towards a particular degree in a master's program, I would refer refer them to a particular person in the faculty, the Schulich School of Engineering to get the information that they need. Yeah, although as I had pointed out earlier, we do have lots of students who have gone and, uh, and done master's degree programs in biomedical engineering and in other types of programs after they've completed ours. Yeah, yeah. 
so and uh, you know and I think about Chris W who is who's in the US right now doing his engineering degree we've had a we've had a fair number of our graduates who've gone into an engineering type route yeah so yep. certainly possible but I can't I can't speak specifically to for example Schulich School of Engineering master's requirements yeah. Emma, would, would it be okay if we asked our students, Ryan, Jocelyn, and Sunan, what are your, what, what are your sage words of advice for our entering class this fall? What's, what's something you think they should know? And, you know, no topic off, off limits. A tip, a trick, words of wisdom, encouragement, a word of welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would definitely say, um, try to support one another as much as you can and try not to, this is from personal experience, but try not to get so caught up in maybe um, rumors you hear from other students or some anxieties you might feel about different classes or things like that. Um, I know sometimes it's easy for the rumor mill to generate some crazy statements or some ideas that people then ride with without kind of checking in with people who can really provide the best answers. So um, I really found in first year, uh, Professor Ting um, and our other professors in our med sci courses and our HSOC courses could really debunk a lot of the myths that were going around. Um, so if you do have questions, try to uh, connect with someone who can really help you out and try to support each other so that you're not just kind of fueling the anxieties or the competitions or something like that that could arise between groups. Yeah, I just like to echo what Jocelyn said and um, just put your blinders on basically. Um, you, before you guys might have been like the top students in all of your classes and your schools even, um, but now it's really just a bunch of you that are in that high um, kind of caliber of uh, education and studying and everything. So it can be easy to kind of get bogged down thinking about, um, oh, do I have the 4.0 who's got it? Um, is, am I keeping up with everyone? Um, as long as you're keeping up with yourself and you're um, staying true to your methods and just working hard, then you should be fine. Um, I think my advice would be, um, so yes, blinders on to gossip, but blinders not on to things that are, uh, you know, interesting to you, even if they're not necessarily within the realm of, uh, you know, uh, your, your major, for example, you know, really explore opportunities that are, you know, in other majors, learn more about HSOC, learn more about BIMF, about biomedical sciences, if that's something you're interested in, take research as an opportunity to, you know, explore different ideas. Um, and also, I think the BHSC program is great because it offers you flexibility, especially in upper years, to take other courses that you're interested in. So I think that really enriches your career um, in undergraduate and helps you build like these uh, intersections between health science and other fields you might be interested in. And also, I think um, the funnest thing on campus when it opens up again is uh, ping pong, which is, it's really it's in, it's in the lounge. So that's the highlight of my undergraduate uh, so far. As well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spend a lot of time in the Feesby Lounge. So the Feesby Lounge is a is a dedicated student only space. I can only go in if I've been invited in, and I've only ever been in once. So, um, and that was for a special a special event with uh, some international students we had. But it is it's a space for students to hang out. There's space for studying. There are microwaves if you want to, and a little kitchenette area. If um, you know, there's a ping pong table. I think there is there pool or foosball. There's something else there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's a place where you can hang out and and relax a bit between classes. You know, I appreciate what the students all said, and and I I spend time when I start teaching uh, and I come into the first year class and I I talk into the second year class. You're actually stronger when you work together when you support each other. You know, in our medical science and HSOC classes, we don't have any weird limit on the number of A's we can give out. I mean, we will set some, we'll set some tough assessments, but if you can get them, I'm happy to give every student in my course an A if that's what they've, if that's what they've earned in doing it. And so you're stronger if you support each other, you're stronger if you work together. And, uh, and I think that's important. 
it, that's really important. And we do, we do components that have teamwork and we do components that build some of those soft skills that you absolutely are going to need uh, as you move forward in life. And I think uh, to build, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead, please, Jocelyn. I think to build off what Ryan said about how you kind of realize everyone is very high achieving in our program. Um, at first that might be intimidating, but it's actually really um, exciting as you work through your classes and as you work more with your classmates because everyone brings a very um, different and interesting perspective to different projects and things like that. But we also have really good and engaging conversations in class. And I think the group work, you learn a lot from each other as much as you do from your professors. So I think it ends up being a huge benefit to all the students. Yeah. We got a couple of, uh, of, of new questions that have popped up there. So one regarding um, students participating in dino athletics. Um, there is no formal requirement for anyone to report that to us, but I would really strongly encourage you to connect with Jennifer Logan and talk through the options um, of planning out your program if you're wanting to do that and uh, stretch your program over five years to actually talk to Jennifer because she has a lot of wisdom to share and there are certain courses that it's easier to easier to sort of postpone or stagger out and others that if you did it it would kind of leave you with a hot mess so uh, I think it is worth getting some getting some academic advising directly from Jennifer if you're planning to do that to accommodate your athletic training and competition schedule. Uh, we've had lots of students who've done dino athletics. We've had uh, swimmers and track athletes. We've had soccer. We've had field hockey. We've had uh, hockey, uh, ice hockey. Um, Rugby. We have female rugby players every year. Uh, rugby players. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a football player, but you know, so we've got students who've played in lots of different dino, dino teams and absolutely happy to work with you as a program to figure out the best path forward. But I would recommend doing it with advising as opposed to just going on your own. Um, and he is asking, if you don't take a minor, how can you make your degree and time in university unique and your own? You know, I think we could take a cohort of, uh, of 50 bio BHSC students and each one would have a different path. And each one would find what resonates for them to make their program unique. You know, making your program unique isn't, it doesn't have to be the minor. It can be that you take a course that's really something different than what you do. Um, you know, I, I recall a student who, who was a hardcore biomedical and was doing immunology research in the summer and cancer research for his honors thesis, but he took some women's studies courses and he took some anthropology courses and ended up doing a master's uh, in the UK at Cambridge in, um, in medical anthropology and medical history and is now doing his PhD in the US at a, at a top at a leading school. He took a different path. He made it unique. He made it his own. The student we've talked about who he did a minor in architectural studies and that set him up well, but really with your option courses, you chart your own path and your unique path through university is also the friendships you make. I mean, I, it's been a few years since I was in the university as a student and I still, those are some of my closest friends uh, now. And so it's the friendships you make. It's the, it's the extracurriculars you get involved with. It's the option courses you take. There are no right and wrong. If you, if you are hoping to go down the medical school path, I'll tell you this, there is no magic checklist for the things you have to do uh, to get there. Be, be true to yourself, be honest with yourself, do the things that resonate and speak to you. And if they do, that's what will make you successful because you'll enjoy the path. So those are some of the uh, some of the words of wisdom I would have, even though I'm a, a few decades out from my undergraduate experience. Are there any other questions? Do our students have any other uh, things they want to add? No, if not, then I am really excited to welcome you guys to the Bachelor of Health Sciences program. Um, we are here for you, whether it is uh, on a screen like this and eventually in the flesh, uh, and we welcome you regardless of the medium. And we are excited to have you join us, and uh, we can't wait to see you.
look, we've got dogs, we've got babies. It's so exciting. <laughs> and then Sunand has indicated, he's, he's got his email there. He's happy to answer any questions you might have. You know, classes may be done now for this semester, but we are still here through the summer. And so uh, as you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to set something up. Jennifer, any last words? Yeah, I, um, I'm all about students being well-informed and making well-informed decisions. So we will be sending you regular communications over the summer, might even start them sooner than the summer, kind of like a countdown to BHSC, um, just so you feel prepped, ready, excited, and well-informed to start the term with us. We've got a, I've got a 30 second video that's going to get you excited and encourage you to sign up for orientation. Here's fingers crossed that we actually get to do it in person. And, uh, and so I'll run that and otherwise feel free to reach out. Welcome aboard. We're really excited to have you. So let's see. So welcome to the BHSC program. We can't wait to meet you. Uh, and yeah, we'll be, the enrollment services will be sending you the link for this meeting once it becomes available. It takes a little bit of time in the cloud for it to, uh, to render, but otherwise stay tuned. We look forward to seeing you in September. Take care, have a great day guys.